we're going to talk about the second important variant of transposition, and that is congenitally corrected transposition. So here we're talking about the combination of abnormal segmental connections so that we have discordant connections at the atrioventricular junction combined with discordant ventricular arterial connections. And in terms of a simple event, those two connections, abnormal connections, cancel each other out. So some call it double discordance. And again, we can find it in either the usual form or in the mirror-imaged variant. Be aware, however, that when we define congenitally corrected transposition in this fashion, we exclude cases of double inlet ventricle with anterior and leftward aorta. And we also exclude cases that have isomerism, absent connection, and strictly we would also exclude cases with double outlet right ventricle, although they are closely connected with congenitally corrected transposition. So, if we take you through some cartoons again, this time we're talking about the morphologically right atrium, here shown in its normal position, connected to, in most instances, the right-sided morphologically left ventricle in the setting of left-hand ventricular topology. And then, even though the pulmonary trunk arises in discordant fashion from this morphologically left ventricle, the pulmonary, the systemic venous return will continue to reach the lungs because of the double discordance. And so the blood will come back to the usually positioned left atrium, but now will enter a morphologically right ventricle. And it is the morphologically right ventricle now, usually left-sided, that pumps the systemic circulation. And as you are well aware, one of the problems in these patients is that the morphologically right ventricle is not designed to support the systemic circulation. So that is the arrangement we see when the atrial chambers are usually arranged. But we can have the same thing with mirror imagery of the atrial chambers. So now the morphologically right atrium is left-sided. And because of the discordant atrioventricular connections, that now joins to a left ventricle, which also is left-sided. So the ventricular mass now is showing right-hand ventricular topology. The pulmonary trunk takes the blood back to the lungs. It returns to the right-sided morphologically left atrium and thence to the right-sided morphologically right ventricle and to the aorta, which in most instances when the atrial chambers are mirror imaged and we have congenitally corrected transposition, that aorta is right-sided. So this is detransposition. So detransposition is not always the same as regular transposition. So if I show you some sections through an autopsied heart, here we have the right atrium, and as you see, it's joining to the finely trabeculated left ventricle which is right-sided. Left atrium on the left, joining to a left-sided, coarsely trabeculated, morphologically right ventricle. If we take a section a little more anteriorly through the heart, then we see that finely trabeculated left ventricle joining to the branching arterial trunk, the pulmonary trunk. And then the most anterior section shows us that the coarsely trabeculated morphologically right ventricle positioned on the left, is giving rise to an anterior and left-sided aorta. And this is an, an unusual specimen because the septal structures are intact. So in patients such as this, relatively rare, but they do exist, the hemodynamics can be entirely normal, but the morphologically right ventricle is supporting the systemic circulation. But the things that bring these patients most usually to your attention is the triad of associated malformations. And these are ventricular septal defect, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, pulmonary stenosis, and anomalies of the tricuspid valve. And in most instances, there are also problems with the atrioventricular conduction axis. So as with regular transposition, we describe the ventricular septal defect as being perimembranous, muscular, and muscular defects can open to the inlet, 
to the apex or towards the outlet, or rarely the defect can be doubly committed. And again, we use the same rules for diagnosis, but remember that this time the surgeon operating from the right side will be looking through the morphologically left. Pulmonary stenosis, we have the same lesions producing obstruction as we had in regular transposition. So stenosis can be valvar, there can be a fibrous shelf. Tissue tags are particularly important in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition, and they can be removed without damaging the conduction axis, which is often not the case for a fibrous shelf, which overlies the abnormally located conduction that I'll describe to you shortly. Abnormalities of the morphologically tricuspid valve most frequently are Epstein's, or is Epstein's malformation. And valvar dysplasia is part and parcel of Epstein's malformation, but can also exist in isolation. But remember that the morphologically tricuspid valve can straddle and override, and there is then a spectrum of malformation leading towards double inlet left ventricle. And we can have a similar spectrum of malformation involving the mitral valve, and when that straddles and overrides, it leads towards inlet right ventricle. So here is Epstein's malformation of the left-sided morphologically tricuspid valve. I'm showing you a close-up of the left atrioventricular junction, and you see that the tricuspid valve is not tethered at the atrioventricular junction, but rather is displaced apically. Unlike the situation where we have Epstein's malformation in the regular, normal heart with concordant atrioventricular connections, however, it is unusual in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition for there to be thinning or atrialization of the inlet part of the right ventricular myocardium. And in most instances, the inlet myocardium retains its thickness compared to the apical trabecular component. This shows you a nice example of straddling of that morphologically tricuspid valve. And there you see the tension apparatus passing through to the morphologically left ventricle, overriding of the valvar orifice. And you see that the consequence of this is that depending upon the degree of overriding, the more overriding, the more hypoplastic becomes the morphologically right ventricle. And consequently, in settings like this, you may need to adopt a functionally univentricular to surgical repair. And this shows you that the mitral valve also can straddle. We're now looking at the right side of a heart with congenitally corrected transposition. So you see the right atrium leading to the finely trabeculated morphologically left ventricle on the right side. And you see that the mitral valve is straddling across the crest of the ventricular septum into the left-sided morphologically right ventricle. And if we section a heart that is at the extreme end of the spectrum of straddling and overriding, now you see the morphologically left ventricle is no more than a slit positioned on the rightward margin of the ventricular mass. And so the dominant right ventricle receives the greater part of the straddling and overriding right mitral valve along with the morphologically tricuspid valve giving us double inlet right ventricle with left hand ventricular topology the incomplete morphologically left ventricle being right sided posteroinferiorly. Again we need to take note of the <coughs> coronary arteries because nowadays the preferred surgical option for correction of patients with lesions in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition is the double switch procedure. So the coronary arteries are again crucially important. And the arteries reflect the ventricular topology. But we then need to take note of their sinusal origin and their epicardial distribution. And we describe that, as you've just heard, for transposition when the age connections are concordant. So in most cases of congenitally corrected transposition, when we have left-hand topology, then as you see here, the right-sided artery has a short main stem and gives rise to the anterior descending artery and to the circumflex artery because this is the morphologically left coronary artery, which is right-sided. 
So the left-sided coronary artery is morphologically right and arises on the left side of the heart and in most instances that gives rise to the inferior interventricular artery. But should we have right-hand topology then the coronary artery distribution will be as we see it in the usual heart because this is indicative the ventricular mass in congenitally corrected transposition with mirror imagery is right-handed so the anterior descending and circumflex arteries will then arise from a left-sided main stem and the right-sided artery will be morphologically right fortunately the concept of facing sinuses does not give us problems in congenitally corrected transposition because in the most usual arrangement the morphologically left coronary artery arising from sinus 2 is still to the left hand. And the morphologically right coronary artery arising from sinus number 1, right hand. Let us also remember the atrioventricular conduction axis. And the location of the atrioventricular bundle depends on ventricular topology coupled with the alignment of the septal structures. And in left hand topology, Almost always there is malalignment between the atrial septum and the ventricular septum, and so the atrioventricular conduction axis is abnormal, and it arises from an anterolateral atrioventricular node. In right-hand topology, for the reasons we're still unable to explain, in most of the cases that have been studied histologically with mirror imagery in right-hand topology, there has been better alignment of the atrial and ventricular septal structures because of the presence either of pulmonary atresia or severe pulmonary stenosis. And in keeping with this, oftentimes there is a normal conduction axis or else paired atrioventricular give rise to a sling of conduction tissue. But this is the typical situation in usual atrial arrangement with atrioventricular septal malalignment the surgeon looking through the right atrium would see the situation like this. He would be looking down upon a mitral valve. The connecting node will not be in the triangle of cock, but instead will be located anterolaterally, and the bundle will encircle the pulmonary valve and pass anterocephalad to the typical perimembranous ventricular septal defect. So should the surgeon choose to approach the ventricular septal defect through the ventricle. More likely these days he will approach through the tricuspid valve, but the arrangement would be seen like this, where the conduction axis passes anterocephalad relative to the ventricular septal defect and also encircles the subpulmonary outflow tract to rise from an anomalous atrioventricular node. Remember also that Abnormal relationships can play a part in distorting the situation in congenitally corrected transposition. And oftentimes there is marked tilting of the ventricular mass. And we describe that in terms of supra-inferior ventricles. There can also be rotation of the ventricular mass, which in the past led to quite some trouble, but we now recognize this and diagnose it as the crisscross heart. But exceptionally rarely there can be segmental disharmony and this is seen atrial chambers join to the ventricular chambers in discordant fashion but still despite that discordant atrioventricular connections the segments are in harmony typically in congenitally corrected transposition usual atrial arrangement goes with left hand topology which is disharmonious and mirror imagery goes with right-hand topology, which again shows lack of harmony. And this goes along with the discordant atrioventricular connections. But in these very rare cases, there can be usual, usual atrial arrangement with right-hand ventricular topology, and still the atrioventricular connections are discordant. So the only way of, co of coping with these very rare malformations is first to describe the location of the segments and then to describe how they are joined together.